All right, welcome to Michael's Record Collection. I'm very excited this week to have with me Shane Howard, a singer-songwriter from Australia who uh, may be most uh, well-known for fronting the band Goanna back in the 80s. Had a huge hit with the song Solid Rock. Um, it was unfortunately not as big a hit here as we would have liked it to uh, have been. I'm sure you would have liked it to have been, but it's pretty big in Australia. Thanks so much for being with me. Thanks, Michael. Thanks for taking the time. Um, it's great to be talking to you across the Pacific in these um, very strange COVID times. So, yes. Uh, yeah, I, I know Spirit of Place was, um, you know, it was that close really in America to um, to breaking through. Uh, there's a few quirks of history that happened there. And um, I mean, we were, I think we were, you know, we were at about number 70 first week in, in Billboard with a bullet and then it, made it a bit further up the charts, I forget where exactly. Um, but, you know, it was kind of all systems go. The uh, the record label we had in America through the Warner Network, Warner Electro Atlantic, which was where, mm -hmm. um, was actually um, ATCO, which was the Rolling Stones label through Atlantic in America. Mm -hmm. And um, if memory serves me correct, what happened was that they they had put it out to radio it was considered a very political song. It was considered a very Australian song. I don't think they thought it would do very well in the States, but I think um, it had massive add-ons, over 200 stations in the first week. And then another, an additional 150, 160 stations in the second week. And it was going to gangbusters, but they had not pressed enough stock. Vinyl, vinyl singles we're talking about then. They'd not mm -hmm. pressed enough stock. They didn't anticipate that response. So by the time they did manufacture, there was a great desire for it, but, but by the time a six week turnaround for vinyl singles, by the time they'd done that, the momentum was lost and um, that little window of opportunity had passed. But um, there's lots of people like yourself out there who fondly remember the band in the States. Yeah, I remember hearing it on the radio and, and um, seeing the video on MTV quite a bit. It had pretty good rotation, I thought, on MTV. and, and um, it was uh, an interesting song. I I have to admit, I was I was I was in a place where I was suddenly finding all these Australian bands, and you know my my friends were not on the same page as me. But I was, you know, of, of course, Men at Work was was breaking big then, and there was there were you know other acts that were getting airplay on MTV, which was very big at the time. There was you know you guys, you had Moving Pictures, Divinals were coming along, uh, Midnight Oil. Um, just all of these Australian bands, and I was, I was, it was like this mystical, yep. you know, land down under that, you know, I was like, wow, it must just be amazing down there with all this great music. Well, it was, it was a fascinating time. It, like you said, it was, um, it was an amazing time for Australian music where it started to explode into America. And I think Little River Band had done that earlier, um, but they were a different kind of actor in the 70s, really. Um, but then in the 80s, we had uh, Men at Work really led that charge, I suppose. And, um, and like, all, like you said, but it was kind of the, at that era in Australia was what we'd call the triumph of pub rock. Um, every you know australia is famous for its hotels all over the country we you know we're the same size as the as america as the states um but you know one fifteenth the population so you've got to travel the same distance for smaller audiences and uh but it, th there was this incredible um cavalcade of bands traveling with six-man road crews and driving the length and breadth of the country and doing live shows. So they were really road savvy and uh, well road worn kind of band. So we were, I think probably hardened by that kind of pub rock era. And um, yeah, you'd be playing six nights a week um, and then traveling you know, onto the next place every day. Um, just working, working, working. You, work, you travel six weeks at a time, you have a few weeks break and then you go six weeks again and on, the road went on forever. So we were kind of, a lot of those bands were very ready for the States and for touring, but in the 80s, it was still a long way away. It was a long way. It was a hard place to get to the States and financially to keep it all together. 
um, to get the kind of green card permissions you needed to travel and tour. It, it was not an easy, easy thing to do. And, you know, to try and manage breaking into the States from, from, yeah, the other side of the world is no easy, easy task. Right. So, uh, Spirit of Place came out in 1982. Um, Goanna was an interesting band. It, it seems almost like it was more of a collective than a band where you had, um, yourself, um, your sister, Marsha, uh, Rose Bygrave, and then it seemed like sort of a, a, a rotating cast. Is, is that kind of how it was at the time? A little bit, yeah. I mean, um, if you went in Goanna, you went anybody. Um, it, we we set out from Geelong, which is about an hour from Melbourne, which is the capital city at the southern end of the country, um, and uh, a population, a city of about 4 million people. But Geelong's about 150,000 people at the time. Big coastal thing, the Great Ocean Road, surfing, um, had a big music culture. And uh, so we... Goanna emerged out of that. We were a four-piece band originally. Um, that band fell apart in the late 70s. And then I went to, uh, there's a great entrepreneur, a promoter at one of the Eureka Hotel in Geelong, a guy called Ian Lovell. And um, he, was a very, he was a very clever entrepreneur. And I knew he was connected into the music industry. I wasn't really. Um, so I went and spoke with him, talked with him, and the the hotel had just fallen over as a live venue. He had nothing to do. He said, okay, I'll work with you and help you out, get a band. So we kind of pulled this band together then after in the, from the ashes of the first band. Um, and <clears throat> we kind of handpicked a lot of the great musicians from around that area. Mm -hmm. um, Rose Bygrave, and um, it was a beautiful keyboard player, beautiful singer songwriter marcia my sister who i was resistant to initially uh, me and wanted her in the band she was my little sister about five or six years younger i didn't want to bring her into this corrupt rock and roll music world <laughs> but um uh so we had this very a lot of people went oh it's a bit um it's a bit fleetwood mac but but it was more organic than that it wasn't any kind of conscious attempt it was just um, so we had, a, it was very unusual for an Australian band to have such a feminine, strong feminine presence. We put that together in Geelong and then we started making, um, great bass player, great drummer, <clears throat> the best we could find in, in that district. And then we made inroads into Melbourne. The lineup changed a little bit. We found this great old double story house in St Kilda in Melbourne, which was the kind of the, um, I suppose the, uh, the Haight-Ashbury of Melbourne, you know, the, um, it was a pretty wild, wild place, the red light district. And this beautiful old double story house that had um, uh, a big room that we converted into our rehearsal room. There was offices upstairs for management. Our road crew had their own room. We, at the back, we printed our own posters. We had an art design room. We were a kind of, we weren't quite a Paris commune, but we were well on the way. Um, yeah, we, we had very, we were fiercely independent and we really tried to the look of the band we we print we went out on the streets and we put our own posters up in the middle of the night on on uh, subway walls and what have you um yeah we were hands on and um it was a great exciting time michael yeah was there um at the time was there the was there some kind of a um was there almost like a rivalry between the 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 Melbourne bands and the Sydney bands, or, or did everybody just play everywhere? Well, you know, we used to say, my father used to say Sydney was all delivery and no content. Um, and, um, <laughs> and that was kind of how Melbourne looked at Sydney. It was like, uh, they're all show business, but not a lot of substance. I think Midnight Oil changed that um that conception uh, there was some great rivalry yeah between sydney and melbourne and a great rivalry even in melbourne you know we'd be coming out of a out of a radio station having done an interview and men at work would be going in you know colin hay so there was great camaraderie and great competition too you know going on yeah so um you know you talked about this uh, this setup you had in this house and 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 I know you guys were working really hard and the story goes and you can, you can, I'm sure you've told this many times and you can elaborate on it. 
the story goes that you were you were feeling a bit um, maybe uh, overwhelmed, maybe a little burnt out, and and you took a sabbatical to uh, what used to be called Ayers Rock and is now called Uluru. Mm. Yeah, I um, basically we um, shifted to Melbourne. I was a father by this stage. With it, you know, I had uh, I had two young children. Um, I trained as a teacher. I was, you know, my wife was a teacher as well. So she would go to work and teach in the daytime, and I five year old to school and you know look after the other three year old and. So I kept the house running. I was the, the neurotic house husband. And, um, and then nighttime, I'd go out and live this other life where we tour with the band and we'd travel around the state in Victoria, traveling maybe two, three hours away from home and then getting back at two or three in the morning up at seven. Mm. And after a while, I got very, very run down. And the doctor said to me, look, you've got to have a break. Um, um, you know, I, I had some health complications. So I'd always wanted to go to Uluru to, uh, I wanted to see was, uh, was Aboriginal culture still alive in this country? You know, was, did people still speak the language? Did people still dance the dances? Was that deep sense of culture still alive? And so I did this journey to uh, Uluru and look, I, I won't go on too much about it. I've been writing, uh, a memoir i suppose over the last um year and a half through this COVID time and um mm -hmm. well actually the last 10 years to be honest but <laughs> uh, when you get time uh and there's a lot of a lot of aspects to that but um catalyst from my early years you know but um you know growing up with aboriginal people around us here in southwest victoria um, where i live and where i grew up um you know down the great ocean road um but the aboriginal people that i saw had been so brutally uh, impacted by colonization that um, so much had been lost of the cultural, the culture, the language um, that, you know, I wanted to go. It was a bit of a quest. It was a bit of a journey, I guess, into the heart of the country. And Uluru is right in the middle of Australia. It is like this big red heart right in the middle. Um, and so it was a long journey by bus and by train. Uh, and by road, the old Gan Railway back in those days. It's a long journey. It's a sense of pilgrimage. And of course, I got there. I I made it there. It was pretty basic in those days. Now you can go to a four star resort with a swimming pool. But back then, you know, you just camped wherever. Um, yeah, and it was. Um, and of course, that experience was to change my life. Yeah, you underwent, um, you know, a bit of a spiritual awakening where you realized that this, you didn't have the connection to your country that you thought you had. Is, is that kind of what happened? Well, it, yeah, it's, um, I suppose I knew Aboriginal people were a fact of life. I knew they existed, you know, and I'd had a lot of encounters and experiences. But um when I went to Uluru, I mean, it just happens that I coincided at a time when uh, the people from Amada, uh, the Anangu, Pitinjara, Yankajara people from Amada, which is about an hour south of Uluru, had come back to renew their connections. They'd come to set up a little um, tent to sell their craft work, uh, carved wooden objects that were burnt and they would burn um, punu, they're called, and they would burn designs onto them, uh, traditional designs onto them with a hot piece of fencing wire. Um, very beautifully done. Um, but, and it was a way of earning a few extra dollars and whatever, but they also, the, the elders had also said to those people, we have to go back and reassert our, um, uh, our connection to that country and in a way to get that country back. Um, so I just happened to be there in the 10 days, the two weeks that they were there from Armada. It was a, a, a bit of a quirk of, of history. Um, and then, you know, one, one day I was at my little camp and I didn't know they were there. And then my little camp, this um, 
this woman was putting up a, a little piece of paper on the toilet block, you know, and it just said, in the other side of the rock sunset. And I said to her, she was quite an attractive woman, I said, um, what's an Inma? And she said, uh, it's a song and dance, you know, um, a ceremony, Aboriginal traditional ceremony. You should come. She said, it's very, very beautiful, very powerful. Um, so I did, I, I walked to the other side, which is about four kilometers um, towards the late afternoon, got there at the sunset. And then as the sun was going down and night was falling, I saw the your woman there and she said, oh, you came, you know, <laughs> and uh, uh, in the circle of fires, the dancers then painted up with uh, white ochre. They come into the firelight as darkness is falling and the light on their body on the ochre make them look like spirit figures dancing. Um, and it was a very powerful moment and they enacted one of the old, one of the old Dukapa Dreamtime stories. Um, and it, it's a story, these, were sto these are stories that are some of the oldest archetypal human stories on earth that we have. Um, in language, in song that may have been sung like that for 10, 20, 30,000 years or longer. Um, and at that very moment, over the silhouetted form of Uluru in the background, the full moon came up. Now, I don't know if that was coincidental or good choreography, but it was one of those moments where I woke up, you know, and I went, wow, I am in someone else's country and I don't know where I am. I'm not quite sure that the God of my ancestors holds any sway out here. And it was one of those very powerful moments, I guess I, um, uh, the road to Damascus moment, Michael, where I, I realized that um, I, didn't know, I didn't know anything about the country. I thought I knew where I was, mm -hmm. but I didn't really. And then I stayed over those next few days. I had a series of experiences. Uh, with the Aboriginal community there that really shifted my thinking in a powerful way. And I then slowly began to uncover, when I went back to Alice Springs and I heard people talking about Aboriginal people in such racist and derogatory terms that, you know, the divide was so clearly evident that mm -hmm. um, Solid Rock emerged out of those um, opposing experiences, I guess. So that was, um, uh, that was actually my... I'm sorry. That was actually my next question was when, when did the germ of that song start for you in terms of getting it down on paper or, or, you know, messing with the guitar? Yeah. Well, not like I had my, a little guitar I took with me, a little nylon guitar I took with me. And, um, it was after that experience, like in the next day, in fact, uh, the next morning when I woke up, uh, after that experience, I um, I would started mucking around with the guitar, and the riff start to began to emerge. And I wrote down in my little journal. I wrote down out here, nothing changes, not in a hurry anyway. And that was the germ of that whole song. That then, you know, I'm I'm looking at Uluru. It's nine kilometers around. It's higher than the Eiffel Tower. It's this powerful, imposing thing. But when you're there, you cannot take your eyes off it. It is absolutely captivating. It's like the Old Testament. The stories are all there written on the rock. Very powerful, imposing reality to be in. And solid rock, sacred ground. Um, we're on borrowed time. You know, we we don't know where we are. We're this white fellow colonizers who've come in here, dispossessed these people. We have no idea where we are or what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And um and uh and, but I saw some, and when I was, that experience of the Inmar, of the dance ceremony, I saw something truly powerful and beautiful and really, really ancient. And, um, you know, once you know, Michael, you can't unknow. And mm -hmm. um, you, you can choose to look away or you have to push on through and deeper into that experience. And I, I choose to push on through mm -hmm. and um and then everything my life changed as a yeah <laughs> i i was going to ask you i'm glad you threw that in about the 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 
first line because you know as a writer when i write things i don't always start with the beginning sometimes i start with with a thought and it's in the middle and i go back and write the beginning later so it's interesting to to hear that you started with that that's a great opening line to a song out here nothing changes not in a hurry anyway it's it it draws you right into you're hearing a story and you instantly want to know more you know and it's it's um it's interesting that you you started at the beginning when it comes to the lyrics it is it is interesting it doesn't always happen that way like you said and um it's an interesting line because there's a duality in that concept alone out here nothing changes you know does it mean that nothing's changing for aboriginal people or does it mean the the continuity of country and landscape and land that mm -hmm. nothing changes so i enjoy those um ambiguities of language um and so yeah it poses a question right from the start i suppose um and yeah uh the song uh is a very interesting reality um all these years down the track you know i still find it quite puzzling i've tried to analyze in the process how it's evolving but i don't know it is still a mystery um i think a germ of an idea comes and maybe there's a little melody attached to that and then it just seems to grow outward as a virus or something <laughs> and then <laughs> the other thing i've identified is that possibly the third verse you know or at, or additional verses um the sense that the last verse has to wrap it all up again and bring it into a sphere um what uh, wb yates the poet called the hammering into unity um you know there's a lot of spot welding and panel beating <laughs> you get given a little gift and then you have to really work hard to to bring it all together sometimes they'll mm -hmm. come to they'll come fully formed very rarely but most of the time you get this kernel of an idea and then you have to yeah belt it into shape and kind of make it all fit and turn it into a sphere well, coming at this song from from my perspective um hearing your song and hearing the way the band played it and it was you know i was a teenager i was in high school and you know to me you know i at that point in my life i'm not looking for messages in my songs i'm looking for does it sound good? Yeah. Does it make me bob my head? Does it, you know, is, does it have a good guitar solo? That kind of thing. How are the how are the yeah. vocals and the and the harmonies and all of that was there. And then it just struck me the the you know the the lyric. Um, they were standing on the shore one day, saw the white sail in the sun. It wasn't long before they felt the sting. White man, white law, white gun. And I was you know, from an American growing up in the Midwest, middle part of the country, the flyover yeah. states, it it said to me, there's a parallel here with, you know, what happened to the Native Americans and what he's talking about, which is clearly not having to do anything with my country. And it it really was the first socially conscious song that really, I think, spoke to me. and And I think that it was, it was just such a well-crafted song that it kind of snuck up on me and it, and it, it really woke me up, not in the same way you were woke up, but it was, it woke me up to a, a, a greater reality beyond myself and my superficial, let me put something on that sounds good kind of thing. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I hear all you say there, um, actually, yeah, Michael, and I've had a lot of responses from, uh, a lot of great, um, uh, actually a lot of writers in america um you know um, um a history professor in uh, from new jersey uh, sam musgrave you know and uh who you know um then went on to because he lectured in history he went on to then um uh, really dig down into 1492 you know, the year before that great book that was about the year before Columbus arrives in the, in Amer in the Americas. Um, and, you know, around that time, not long after Solid Rock went out into the States, I got sent a cassette and to my shame, I can't put my hands on it anymore. And I forget the name of the group, but they're a First Nations group from the States. And they did a version of the song uh, that was done with uh, Native American instruments. Hmm. And um, 
And I hadn't thought of it until that moment that it was absolutely as relevant to America as it was to Australia or, you know, Africa or wherever. And yeah, it's very interesting. There's, there's actually, it wasn't until that moment that I looked at the back at the song, at the lyric, and went, there's nothing in there that really is too identifying that it's Australia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so someone hearing it on the radio for the Even first time. Even though in my mind, I felt... <laughs> Mm. Sorry, the, yeah, yeah. The, like yourself. Yeah. Um, and I look, I, it, um, I guess I knew too that um, it wasn't going to be popular in Australia, <laughs> and uh, I knew it had to be well made. It had to be, you know, musically crafted in a very powerful way. But it is interesting that. At Uluru at that time, I was given those opening lines and the really the first verse and even the beginnings of the second verse and the riff. And it kind of, those things kind of came together in the space of a few days. Mm -hmm. And I think the riff was really a powerful, it was a very special gift to be given actually that riff. Um, and it stands the test of time. It's still one of those little, um, um, lovely moments that's still a pa it's a great riff to, to play 40 years later um and um there have been you know uh, innumerable versions of the song done here in australia from death metal bands to um to very uh gentle feminine solo uh, women who uh, singer songwriters who've done very gentle versions um but uh the it had to we i knew it had to we had to make a great recording of it it had to be strong it had to and look it had a great beat and you could dance to it and i think <laughs> that's what it was a great rock song yeah despite what it was saying it was a great rock song i think that's what you're articulating too and um look i at the time the record company didn't want to release it as a single um they thought it was too political it, you know it had the word genocide in for goodness sake yeah. um I, we knew that I thought we might get, uh, I stuck my, to my guns. I, I said to them, I, it should be the first thing that the band go in or releases. I thought we might get a bit of airplane, get to travel to Sydney and do some gigs. You know, we hadn't even been there other than the James Taylor tour in 81. And um, so um, it just went through the roof, you know, but I think it took a while for it to sink in what it was saying. Um, but for Aboriginal people right across the country, um, I think they got it the very first time they heard it. Yeah. And, uh, and of course, it threw me headfirst one into mainstream Australia and commercial radio and commercial success. But at the same time, it threw me headfirst into Aboriginal Australia and all everywhere we went, there were Aboriginal people going, who are these white fellas? And what the hell would they know and what they think about? And, and other people go, well, yet they being champions for us, you know. So it was um it was a wild ride, yeah. Yeah. Um how does a rock band go about finding a a, a didgeridoo player to come in and play on a record? <laughs> <laughs> well that's <laughs> That's a, that's another quirk of history. We were back at, we, uh, we'd done, we just done the James Taylor tour in 1981. We weren't really that well known. We were known in Melbourne. We hadn't toured outside of Victoria, the state of Victoria. And um, in, uh, we'd just done the James Taylor tour of Australia. And that had got us to Sydney, to Brisbane, to Adelaide. Um, and of course, it got us to meet James Taylor and Leland Sklar and um, Dan Dugmore and um, uh, all those great musicians and stuff at the time. Um, and uh, we we came back to Melbourne. We were starting to really get some traction in Melbourne. Um, and Phil is saying to fill venues. We went back to our old hunting ground in Geelong to the Eureka Hotel and we're doing sound check one afternoon. There's these two Aboriginal fellows up in the bar and they're very dark skinned, which was um, 
unusual for Victoria, um, you know, to, to see people who are so very, very um, dark skinned and obviously from like Queensland or the Northern Territory. And we were running through solid rock and uh, we started to work it into the set. And at the time, Rose was playing this thing on the, the uh, keyboard synth, you know, wah, wah. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. uh, a kind of emulation of a dig that was pretty naff. Uh -huh. And uh, these two fellas came in and Billy came up and he said, uh, hey, how you going? And he said, that song you're singing. He said, that, that's a good song. And uh, I said, oh, you like it? He, he said, yeah, yeah. He said, um, he said, uh, he said, what are you doing with that keyboard? And yeah, and, and Rose said, oh, I'm kind of, you know, trying to make a didgeridoo noise. He said, I play didge. And, uh, and we said, oh, true. And he said, yeah, he said, I got one at home. And uh, I said, do you want to play it with us tonight then? And he said, yeah, if I got time to go home again, I said, absolutely. So he took off, he and Floyd took off and then they turned up and came up to the band room and up in the band room of the Eureka Hotel, we ran through it with Didge playing along for the first, just acoustically for the first time. Mm -hmm. It was that another of those powerful transformative moments. And then that night we did it last song of the night and I introduced Billy. He came out on stage and start, opened it up with a Didge. Our sound guy turned it up <laughs> flat out. You know, the bottom end of the Didge was, you know, rocking the walls. The whole windows were reverberating, <laughs> the whole place was shaking. The whole crowd went crazy. You know the the song started up and by the you know halfway through the song his mate floyd who was a beautiful dancer incredible traditional dancer he suddenly emerges out of the crowd pushes his way through in the instrumental section he jumps up onto the stage and starts to wadama or dance you know traditionally like a like an eagle and he's doing this incredible dance and of course it's just um it, 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 the song, everything's rocking anyway, but everything just goes beyond. <laughs> and by the end of the song, the audience are just off their heads. The whole place is electric, and um, and you know, Billy just looks at me and he's just laughing. And uh, it was one of those really incredible moments because at that point, um, we knew that something was very special is happening and that maybe our generation was ready for change. And this is uh Billy is Billy Inda, the, the, the guy who plays on the record. Yeah. Billy Cummins. Well, then on the record it came to the recording and Billy came into the studio and uh, Trevor Lucas, who was, um, we brought, had just come back to Australia. He was um, married to Sandy Denny and part of Fairport convention, of okay. course. So he'd come back. Yeah. He, he understood, kind of folk and because my roots and Rose's roots were really in folk music, but there was no room for folk music in the eighties. It was kind of, <laughs> you know, if you're not playing rock, don't bother coming. So he had this lovely way of being able to marry the folk sensibility into a rock reality too. He understood what we were trying to do. Mm -hmm. So when it came to the ditch, Trevor really got it. And, um, but he asked Billy for, some more elaborate stuff in the middle section. If you could play some, you know, bird calls and some really elaborate stuff. And Billy right. came to me and he said, brother, he said, brother, he said, I, 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 you know, if I can play all that, you know, the drone stuff and all this stuff, but I, I can't do that flash stuff really. I'm not that good at the flash stuff. He said, but I know someone in Melbourne who can. So he said, I'll make a call. So he did. Um, and then about an hour later, this uh, Aboriginal guy <laughs> walks into the studio in a three-piece suit and bare feet, uh, carrying a dig. And he goes, <laughs> he walks in, he goes, you rang? <laughs> and, and that was Joe, that was Joe Geyer, who was also from North Queensland, Cooker Yalanji mob. And uh, Joe came in and he was a really competent yidaki or yiggy yiggy as they call it um, or didgeridoo player mm. and so billy did all the all the nuts and bolts through the song is billy but then in the middle section and all those fancy parts the very the elaborate bits were done by joe Gaia. and uh and then uh that was it went down very quickly and then B joey went to leave and we said oh joey i need contact and address and 
um, to pay you and stuff. And he, and, and your name on the record and all that. He said, ah, he said, just say my brother did it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it was Billy. But this, this far down the track, I think we can actually, we should honor what truly happened, you know. And yeah. uh, so Joe and Billy did that together. And they're both Cooker Yellingy, they're both from the same clan of that uh, northern Queensland uh, tribal group. Yeah. It was a beautiful moment, a series of beautiful moments there. Do you recall um, what it was like making the video? Can you just kind of tell me about that experience? Well, again, Trevor was central. Trevor Lucas was central to making the video because he'd started moving into filmmaking. Um, and um, so he pulled that crew together. Uh, there were some great people on that crew who went on to do some great work and in their own right. Um, and uh, it was done at a, ven a place called The Venue. It was a big, a big uh, venue that, you know, held maybe, I don't know, five, six, 800 people downstairs and, you know, 1,200 people or more upstairs. Um, and uh, it, we did it one afternoon before a live gig. Um, so it was a series of... Um, performances we ran through and they focused on you know bits and pieces and did cut to cutaways and then in the evening that she because we kept the same clothes on the same lighting the same everything we then uh, they filmed the whole thing um live as well so it was stitched together from lots of bits and pieces i guess um but um yeah we, we hadn't made a film clip really before and um this kind of abstract process was a bit kind of bizarre, but um, Trevor was a great producer for us, really. He steered us through that first record and he steered us through, you know, the film clips and that, that, um, uh, that entree really into the, the world of the music industry. Um, and uh, um, yeah, the film clip was, uh we billy had billy cummins after that uh, billy Inder was actually billy cummins and after that billy left and joined a, a great original band called no fixed address um who had just made inroads into melbourne at the same time mm -hmm. uh contemporaries <clears throat> so um around there was a bit of a gap there and unfortunately um billy wasn't around when we did the film clip for solid rock so there's no ditch player in that film clip afterwards a guy uh, a beautiful man called uh bobby jabbernunga joined the group um who came from south australia and graham davidge who plays that incredible lead solo on um solid rock very simple but incredibly powerful yeah um uh, yeah graham knew bobby and he brought him to the group uh, from south australia so yeah there were lots of people lots of influences coming in and out of the group ross hannaford was another one um who'd been in daddy cool you know amazing band in the 70s who'd made inroads into the states back way back in late 60s early 70s um yeah you know, ross was a, a legend and he kind of came and added his bit to goanna um lots of great musicians came and went um uh, but yeah there was that always that solid core and uh, you know, Rose and Mars and myself really right at the center of it all, Bobby Ross on drums. Um, and, uh, and you know, um, Trevor Lucas was kind of central to all that production stuff. And uh, the film clip, yeah, look, the film clip is a moment in time. It's a day in your life, um, but it lives for a very long time, Michael Hay, and it's a, <laughs> it's a moment frozen in time now. Yeah. Um you you mentioned it you know this is a song that it, it rocks pretty hard and it's a, it's it's an upbeat song and and spirit of place has a few songs like that but it's it's also got its moments more that are more folky and more um almost like a country rock um and um it's uh it's interesting because i think it it, it really shows some of your influences that um, you know, those that just know the single really aren't aware of. 
Yeah, there's a, it's, a, it's a bit of an eclectic mix. I mean, when I listen to Spirit of Place, I hear, this far down the track, I hear the sound of youthful optimism and of this kind of lovely, uh, yeah, an optimism about change is possible, um, um, possibilities, yeah, about solid rock, about justice, about um, environmental justice with like the Franklin flow, which was a kind of, I, I kind of tie that song, even though it's not on the album, I tie it to that record, uh, coming as it did in the middle of it. Um, uh, about environment and about um, Aboriginal, uh, Aboriginal rights and justice issues. Um, the the songwriting, I suppose, is eclectic. Um, Factory Man is a kind of country. It's all. It could be on the first Eagles album, mm -hmm. you know. Um, uh, Peaceful, easy feeling. I don't know. You know that kind of those influences. And I, I got to say, I love those very early Eagles albums. Maybe the first two. Uh, after that, it became a bit too obviously commercial but i mean great recordings are all great recordings um i mean the biggest influence on my writing was of course bob dylan um and i, I accidentally came across him when i was 10 years old you know um from an english couple that moved next door to us uh, my dad worked in a factory all his life and they'd come he'd come to work as an engineer at the factory and they lived next door and he got my brother to come in my older brother to come in one day because his friends in England had sent him this uh, import album uh, of this young bloke called Bob Dylan called The Times Are A-Changing and that just completely blew my head off like um, The Lonesome Death of Hattie Carroll, The Times Are A-Changing, um, Hollis Brown, um, yeah can you do that, can you write those songs, can you sing like that? So you know I can draw a line from Solid Rock back to that experience actually. Mm -hmm. Um, and Dylan's writing about those civil rights issues back in the 60s in America. And I think in many ways, we were, we were very conscious of that through our televisions and stuff in, in Australia. <coughs> <coughs> and we're deeply moved and upset by the watching that kind of racism um, in the States. At the same time, we're, we're seeing this incredible uplift from people like John F. Kennedy and uh, the optimism that was in the world back then in the in those in the early sixties, mm -hmm. and I guess and it's not till the seventies for me and the eighties that I go, wow, um, here we are, you know, criticizing America and have a look at our own backyard. We've got the same issues. So you know, this factory man, stand your ground is a, a really an issue about. Um, you know, it's a very working class kind of perspective of, um, but it also comes out of um, reading the works from Soviet writers like um, uh, Arthur Kustler, Darkness at Noon, and uh, uh, Solzhenitsyn, you know, um, about the oppression and the gulags in, um, in communist uh, Russia. So, you know, like um, authoritarianism can come from anywhere, it can come from you know, capitalist countries, it can come from communist countries, it can, it can come from, from anywhere. Um, right, Children of the Southern Land is a song that really rocks. I love, that's a great song to play live. It's, um, it's a bit epic. And I don't know if you were able to get hold of the live album we released last year, Michael. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, it was great to go back and revisit that live stuff and realize what a great live band Goanna were too. Mm -hmm. Um, and that live recording, I think, is really very special. It's uh, with its light and shade and the way that it pulls back to keyboards and very uh, gentle instrumentation, but then it rocks powerfully as well. Um, and it has a lot of the energy of, say, Neil Young and Crazy Horse or something. <laughs> so all those things, James Taylor is in that album, you know, Razor's Edge. Uh, there's all these great influences that predominantly come out of America, um, out of the States from that era. I guess I'm a 70s, 60s and 70s kind of guy. That's the yeah. influences I'm getting. Um, yeah, I love yeah, I so love Razor, uh, Razor's Edge as, as a personal favourite off the album. Do you have... A favorite song on the album other than you know solid rock obviously was the was the one that that hit big but do you have 
you know, favorite tracks? It's like kind of like your children. You pick a favorite, or or does one stand out over another? Um, they ebb and flow. You know, like um, I I have neglected a lot of songs from that record, and it wasn't until I last year I got the chance because of COVID. I actually and there was no live work at all. It hasn't been for a year and a half, really. Um, I got the opportunity to go back and work um, you know, with some people and build the Goanna website, which had was something that had been on the long finger. Uh, and to pull all that old stuff together, um, uh, to re-release digitally the um, Oceania and uh, Spirit Returns album, and, uh, and then the live Goanna record, as well and so I got to I, I was submerged in Goanna land and uh it was a great thing to do actually I you know you you kind of just keep moving as an artist into the next thing and the next thing and Goanna was something way back there and it was powerful and it set up my entire life as an artist and I'm eternally grateful to Solid Rock and Spirit of Place for what it allowed me to do to live my life as an artist mm. um but you do the next thing in front of you. You're just going forward, going forward. There's a gig next week. There's a gig over here. There's things. Everybody wants something. And then COVID came and it was like your know, peace in the valley. And I was able to really think about Goanna again and listen to it. And what a powerful record Spirit of Place was. And even Oceania. Um, really powerful working with Billy Payne and Lee Sklar and George Massenberg, you know, the absolute godfather of audio um, in the world coming out of America. Um, these powerful experiences came back to the foreground and uh, um, um, Shadow of Your Love didn't make that album, but it was the B-side of one of the singles. And um it's a, it belongs on that record as well. And it's a funny thing how little songs like that can grow to be a lot more powerful than they were at the time. Um, it was just a little B-side of a single. But it, it has grown in, in my, as an older man, it speaks to me more now than it did as a young man. And I, I hear so much in that song. Um, uh all of them really children of the southern land is still resonating for me now and i've started playing it again and i i, I abandoned it for 25 years but um there's um the riff in um uh scenes from the occasional window um you know i go i listen back to that album i go how did i write those songs <laughs> they're, they're um they're, they're interesting they're, they're musically intricate and complex uh and they're lyrically uh quite interesting too and you know they a lot of them stand the test of time i i i guess i'm proud of that work and you should be it's uh, do i have a favorite <laughs> do i have a favorite though michael no. I, I can't they're like they're all my children um <laughs> you know you can't play favorites with your children right. but like you know uh sometimes like your children every now and then one of them comes to stay with you and yeah you know, they come into the foreground that's a great analogy i like that a lot um when the band broke up you you went and, and you you know you embarked on your solo career and it's it's striking that um the the styles change from album to album a little bit but there's always this underlying um, folk country root to it all. It's almost like what we would, even though you're Australian, it's what we would call Americana now, the, 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 the musical style. Um, and then you moved into, you know, I think you started to explore a little bit more of your Irish roots and you got uh, some Celtic influences in there. What What is kind of, um, what have you kind of picked up from your, your ancestral home? Yeah, okay. Well, look, it's undeniable. Um, we were bombarded with American movies, American literature, uh, American music, you know. Um, so those influences are undeniable. Um, you know, from John Steinbeck to Woody Guthrie's Bound for Glory to Jack Kerouac's On the Road, they're all in there. Um, and uh, yeah, and 
about 20, 20, a few years ago anyway, uh, I was I was awarded a an Americana Award, um, the Quill Award for songwriting. And um, I might have been a bit embarrassed about that 10 years ago, um, but I'm not anymore. Like I said, the influences are undeniable. And I guess, yeah, in many ways, what I do is kind of Americana. Where does American music come from? It comes from Scotland, England, Ireland, German influences predominantly. Um, and of course, then that other big, you know, railroad coming through is the blues and those African experiences that that give us all those great blue notes and all that other kind of rhythmic and soulful influence. Um, in the 90s, I mean, the Irish thing, my ancestral Irish roots, they, they were always there growing up, you know, like the Clancy brothers and, you know, my mother knit, when we were kids, my mother knitted us Aaron sweaters and <clears throat> I didn't really know it as a child, but uh, where I live and where I grew up was the highest concentration of Irish migration in Australia. I didn't realise that growing up. It's only when I got older and looked back and I went, oh my God, you know, we were in an Irish ghetto. Um, I, uh, a little bit, I suppose it's a bit like, um, I don't know, is there, is there a, uh, is there American equivalent? It's a little bit Appalachian, um, but it's a little Irish enclave. But it, but <clears throat> the powerful influences we're getting because of modernity are through the radio, and that's America. Um, you know, uh, we're getting Bob Dylan, we're getting Peter Paul and Mary, we're getting we're getting the whole shebang. You know, we're getting um, all the pop music, all the great. You're getting Jackson Brown, we're getting all of it. Um, but then in the, this Irish thing is running alongside it. And, uh, but that's kind of a bit diddly diddly. It's a bit embarrassing, you know, in a way, as you, cause it's not cool. And it wasn't until 92, I did a tour in Australia. I was asking if I'd like to do a tour with Mary Black. And I went, yeah, I, I, I knew that Declan Sinnott was playing in her band and Declan had been in a band called Moving Hearts. They'd worked with Van Morrison. Um, Declan was a, a giant of a guitar player. Uh, there were some great players in her band and Mary was no slouch as well. Great song. She was always, she wasn't a writer. She was a singer and interpreter of songs. So I did that tour. We got on like a house on fire with Mary and the band. Um, she, took a song of mine called Flesh and Blood that I was playing live, but hadn't recorded. Uh, she took it back to Ireland, unbeknown to me, she recorded it uh, in the late 92, early 93, released it. It was a top five hit in Ireland. And her manager, and uh, Joe O'Reilly, her husband called me up out of the blue one day and said, oh, hi Sheen, it's Joe O'Reilly here. Uh, Mary's had a big hit with your song Flesh and Blood in Ireland. We'd love you to come to Ireland to do with her. And I went, yeah, pull the other leg. You know, <laughs> who is this really? <laughs> and I hung up. I thought it was a friend pulling my leg. He rang back and I said, oh, I don't know what happened there. We got disconnected. And I, so I did that tour. It was incredible to suddenly arrive in Ireland, Michael, and play five nights at the Point Theatre to 5,000 people every night. Um, and I did think if my ancestors could only see me now, having left Ireland during the famine, in the worst of circumstances, my great grandmother is a 12 year old orphan, um, you know, thinking with no possible thought of ever being able to make it back there. Um, so there was a sense of a lovely, um, of a circle. And, uh, of course, I did a lot of tours in with Mary, did some incredible tours, incredible shows through Holland, through America, through the States, seeing America, the States and New York and right through the southern states and across to St. Louis through uh, Irish Eyes, which is you know, the comedy never stops, um, was amazing, uh, quite fascinating. But I remember Declan Sinnott in about 93, he said to me uh, one time when we were at Play, jamming after a, after a series of concerts, he said he was a great champion of my songs, and he said, um, "You know, you should get the um, 
you should get the American influences out of your songs. And I was deeply offended, you know, because I'm an Australian songwriter. Mm -hmm. And, um, but then it sat in my head and I thought about it and I thought about what he said. And I realized that he was right and that in a way I had to go right back to the source, um, right back to the folk music source because all that great american music has come out of that tradition you know ireland scotland england um germany sure. whatever um mexico let's not forget mexico um so i had to go back to the, those great traditional songs so i buried myself i submerged myself for years in traditional irish music and uh, that was an incredible journey and, and it's ongoing i'm still mm -hmm. there um at the bottomless well and it is a bit like going back to the well and um so i saw where the beginnings of americana came from too and i feel like now i'm able to bring you know all this deep australian uh aboriginal influence and landscape influence together our own history um all that americana influence and understand where it's come from and kind of bring that all together into songwriting and um but in you know it took till the 90s for me to really understand what i had been doing back in spirit of place in oceania and in those early years mm -hmm. the reason i ask shane is I, because the the um the album you put out other side of the rock you you remade solid rock and it's it's this interesting new version which it's kind of an aussie celtic hybrid uh, like a dirge really yeah, we did two versions on that recording. One stripped right back, uh, really slow, and it is it is like a dirge, and uh, it's mournful. It is. Um, yeah, and I guess I wanted it to reflect um, the journey that I'd made over 30 years through Aboriginal Australia. Like I said before, Solid Rock threw me headfirst into Aboriginal Australia. And what a journey that's been, uh, you know, everywhere we went, there were Aboriginal people at every gig going, wanting to check us out, sitting up till two or three in the morning, talking with people, uh, hearing the stories everywhere you go of stolen children, of massacres, of stolen land, of dispossession, of the hardship. But, you know, through all of that, this incredible humour, yeah, you know, in a contemporary reality, shining through, in the midst of all that hardship, uh, which is very parallel, I guess, to the um, Irish experience as well. You know, Ireland had six to eight hundred years of colonial um, imposition, and um, and eventually got to kind of sovereignty. Um, so, you know, that kind of hardship breeds an incredible humor and quite a dark humor too i think you know the jewish people have it as well this but uh, even a darker humor mm -hmm. um but i i wanted to reflect the 30 years of stories that seeped into me um you know uh i carry all those old people who are gone now those old Aboriginal people and the stories they shared with me, I carry all their hardship, their sorrow, their loss. And I wanted to reflect that in that version. And then the other version, which finishes the record, of course, is, is up tempo and um, it, it keeps rocking hard. It's more celebratory. Um, so these, it's bookended by the sorrowful mysteries and the, this powerful, like, um, you know, um, maintain the rage yeah mm -hmm. and uh, what does martin luther king say the uh the arc of the the moral arc of the universe bends toward justice uh keep believing that keep fighting for it yeah yeah so it's been you know as we are here in 2021 it's been 40 years since your spiritual awakening that led to you know so much of of what you've done throughout your life um and, and you know a, a big divergence between the path you thought you were on and the path you ended up being on what has changed what has improved for the aboriginal peoples of australia and and you know i'm sure there's probably still a long way to go but ha has it gotten better in the last 40 years 
Um, yeah, it has. Yeah, I can faithfully say it has. Yeah. Uh, was it too slow? Yes, it was. Um, did I think change would be quicker? Yes, I did. Um, you know, that was youthful op optimism. By the time we got to Oceania and Michael, I had a feeling that the dice was loaded and the cards were stacked and um, that there are very powerful and wealthy forces in this world who, who are keen to maintain the status quo. Um, and then by the time we got to Spirit Returns, which was a revival a reunion album in 1998, um, you know, what's that, uh, you know, 15 years later or whatever, um, I felt powerfully again that, yeah, you've got to, that we were right and we're on the right track and you've got to keep fighting and fighting hard for these things like environment um, and like justice issues, social justice issues. Um, and look, we've done it all, we've come a long way in terms of uh, Aboriginal people are much better off than they were. Is there further to go? Yes, there is. In the state of Victoria, um, there is now this they're on the pathway of uh, a journey of uh, truth telling. Uh, and there's a commission for truth and justice on the journey to treaty, establishing a treaty with the First Nations people. Now we all know from the American and Canadian experience that treaties can be broken. And um, so there's, you know, it's Ab Aboriginal people are not too optimistic about what treaties might deliver. But I think one of the really important things is the truth telling. And that's the part that hurts us as white fellas, because we don't want to hear that our history was not was lesser than noble. Um, you know, that it has um, some really deep, there are some deep scars in the landscape. But you know, the old saying, the truth will set you free. So let's, let's dig into the pain and let's, uh, let's work our way through it. I think if we can do that, we can get out the other side and I think we can be a much more cohesive nation that is a, is reconciled with its ugly history. Um, and I think that makes you, you can build a, a proper national narrative from that. They're good things. Um, environmentally, the, the jury is still out, hey, Michael. I mean, are we going to make it through? Uh, are we going to avoid extinction, really? as a species. Um, there are so many uh, species going extinct on our planet every day, um, every year. It, it's uh, it's going to be hard. I feel, I fear for the my children and my grandchildren. Uh, I think we've bequeathed them a very tough reality um, to come in the world. Um, but uh, hope springs eternal and you've got to keep hoping as a grandfather mm. um, that there is a, a future for them. So you know, can we turn this around? Yes, I think we can. We're going to have to work really hard now. We should have started 30 years ago doing this properly. We haven't because we've been distracted by commerce and self-interest. Um, and, you know, I know there's lots of people who um, differently and go it's a hoax and whatever um i i wish i could think like that but i can't i you know i i want to take it down you know um we're all optimistic we hope our house won't won't burn down but we still take out an insurance policy in case it does because it does happen um yep. so yeah i would rather err on the side of caution and look, as someone said what's the worst thing that happens if we really uh take positive and direct action about you know um being much more awake to environmental stewardship um, the worst thing that happens is that we make a better planet. Well, you know, that's not a bad outcome. <laughs> so, you know, uh, I'm happy to live with a little less so my grandchildren can have a little more. Yeah. Um, well, you said it best. Uh, out here, nothing changes. Not in a hurry, anyway. So <laughs> that's maybe, about it. <laughs> maybe it'll just take some time. Um, yeah. I, I, and, uh, you know, 
Uluru, Uluru is still there, Michael. Uh, Uluru is still there, yeah. still standing there. It is not changing. Out there, nothing changes. And, you know, we might come and go. It will still be there. Yeah. The um, You put out an album last year, um, Dark Matter. What's new for Shane Howard since uh, since Dark Matter? And, uh, and, and is there a... Is there an expected or an anticipated date when we might see your memoirs pr uh, published? Uh, um, how long's a piece of string? Yeah, um, yeah. I um, we worked on Dark Matter, which was it was a kind of a big record to make. It actually re returned back from, I suppose, a lot of folky sort of stuff into a, a bit of a mixture of things that were rock and folk, and um, yeah, and kind of in a way, I'm. I'm wandering through my entire catalogue. There's 14 solo albums there. Um, and at this stage, you know, time past and time present at this age are all the one thing. It all feels like one moment in time. Um, I We made that record and we released it at the Portrait Folk Festival in March of last year. And within five days, um, COVID struck here, the world shut down live touring ended we went into lockdown um and um i think i've done maybe less than a handful of live gigs since then um so it never got taken out into the live um world that record um it's an interesting eclectic record again i think yeah that covers a lot of territory the all those themes that i think i've been dwelling on and trying to drill down into over the years um so uh covid pulled ev pulled us all up and i had to then um i did the things that um needed to be done i fixed those things around the house that needed mending i um i i grew a better vegetable garden i um I uh, I finally got to uh, construct the Goanna website that had been wanting to be done forever, and and pulled together all those um, all the Goanna stuff that had been sitting in boxes and on shelves and in cupboards and you know and needed attention. Um, so I had time to do that. A lot of stuff got sent off to the National Film and Sound Archive. Uh, that was a great burden to have off my shoulders. Um, and websites are a great digital museum really it's a great place to park a lot of photos memorabilia whatever um that was a great burden off my shoulders to be able to share that stuff with other with the world um and the facebook page for goanna um i, I was able to do the same with shane howard and start assembling a lot of just pulling together a lot of threads i've been working on the book for about 10 years now but it was always in bits and pieces because um you're always you're always distracted by live work and live work takes up an enormous amount of your time or making a record you're always doing the next thing in front of you and um there's not a lot of time to go back and look at your past so every now and then i'd take three days off and i'd disappear into the mountains or to somewhere by the ocean and i i would write without distraction so it's been great this year as well this year and a half to really dig down into the book and um i i i would um okay i'm promising myself in fact my wife says i have no more time and it's um it's due to, it will be finished this year yeah but um it, it's become a bit of a passion now michael i i'm enjoying this journey going back um through my life and through my career and i hope trying to write a story that i hope is interesting to the reader well you've you've led a, a very interesting life so i'm i'm looking forward to that and i'm sure your fans are as well that website is uh, shanehoward.com.au and um www.goannaband.com as well i think if you want to find the goanna all right Shane Howard, uh, it's been great talking to you. I really appreciate it. You, you, you wrote songs uh, that record "Spirit of Place" enriched my life. I'm sure it enriched a lot of people's lives. 
Um, you have a lot of fans. You're, you're still going strong uh, all these years later. Uh, it's been a great career for you, and it's you know I hope that it continues on for for quite some time. It's uh, it's been a real pleasure talking to you. Thanks so much, Michael. Thanks for taking the time, and uh, yeah, it's a big shout out from uh, from the Lizard of Oz to the uh, to the states, and um, and you coming out of the COVID nightmare as well. So. Uh, Here's the live music coming back and here's a lots more music to be made. So thanks for your support. Only my